All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, and, and let's welcome Stefan Thomas. Uh, hi, Stefan. Hello. I hope the uh, microphone and everything is working. Yeah, we can hear you, hear you loud, loud and clear. Well, let me uh, introduce myself and then I'll introduce you. Uh, my name is Brad Stone. I'm a, a senior executive editor for Global Tech at Bloomberg and the author of uh, a couple of books about technology. Uh, Stefan, if you follow anything related to crypto, you probably already know who he is, um, but I will uh, read from his, uh, his Twitter bio. Uh, open source developer and distributed systems advocate, co-creator of Interledger, founder and CEO of, of Coil. Um, just to unpack that a bit, uh, Stefan joined the, open, the, uh, the crypto community back in 2010, produced the popular What is Bitcoin video, introducing millions of users to Bitcoin and created Bitcoin JS, the first implementation of Bitcoin cryptography in the browser. He was one of the first employees and the CTO at, at Ripple. And as part of this that work, uh, co-created the Interledger, an open internet-like protocol for value transfer. And in 2018, he founded Coil with the vision to create a better business model for the web that's not reliant on advertising or subscription services. Stefan, I just am now noticing that your Twitter handle is just moon. Does that mean you're you're throwing in with Elon and Jeff and heading out to space? I'm so glad you asked that because like everyone assumes that, but I picked the name when I was 12, and the the, the term <laughs> going to the moon in terms of financial success didn't really exist yet, so it has nothing to do with that, unfortunately. Uh, well, that's that. di that's disappointing because I've I've known you for a long time, and if you were uh, going to the moon, I I could you know maybe I could beg a, a seat on the ship but um okay well so not anytime soon um you know i feel like we need to start with the news of the day i like a lot of people uh i've been doom scrolling twitter all day looking at the news of the ukrainian in, uh invasion I've, i have cnn on in the background right now uh you're um you're from germany as a european i just wonder how you feel about the crisis and is there a role for uh, the crypto or the blockchain community to play today? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've been the same thing here. Like, I've been trying to get as much information as possible. It's it's incredible tragedy and, and so sad to see that um, so close to, to home. And then, of course, I have a lot of friends who are from Ukraine, still have family there. And, and so my heart goes on to uh, out to all the people who are affected by this. And um, you asked about, you know, what is the connection to crypto and i think it's it's kind of thing interesting like a lot of people are pointing out that um you know crypto has been down today um you know contrary to the narrative that hey it's sort of a a safe haven in in times of crisis um i think that there are obviously different people are using crypto for different reasons right and so you're seeing kind of the different things overlapping um, and I think what you're, what's driving the price right now, what's dominating um, the price action is, is, is pretty much like speculation and, and a lot of Wall Street type in the institutional investors. And so um, it makes sense that it would act similarly to other uh, speculative assets in, in this kind of situation. But I do think that that's notwithstanding that there is an underlying potential use where people might say like, hey, I'm going to hold on to some Bitcoin just in case I do have to pick up and leave quickly and I, I have to, um, uh, you know, be, be mobile and have my assets with me and things like that. Like I've moved um, internationally recently and, you know, as, as in previous times that I've moved internationally, my crypto has been the, um, the, the easiest asset to bring along. So I, I do think that there is a role for crypto in, in that area. Um, we're just seeing other factors dominating right now. I mean, it just felt like the price of Bitcoin is down today, it's been down this week, is, is about half of what it was in the fall. So it seems like theoretically what you're saying still holds true. But the, the market really questions the idea right now that these, these assets are safe havens or, or solutions in times of political instability. Is it just that, that other narrative, the you know, the, the, the Wall Street gambling narrative um, has has kind of over overpowered the idealism that Bitcoin once represented? Yeah, I mean, there's there's many sources of demand and many sources of supply for any asset or good, right? And so um, sometimes you just have a, a type of demand, in, in this case, speculative demand, that's just driving um, or, or dominant because it's just so much outpacing all the other forms of demand for, for that asset. And so... Uh, when that demand suddenly drops because the same people who were previously speculating on it, like they're less 
interested in being as leveraged, et cetera, they want to take some of the risk off the table. Um, that obviously affects the price because that demand suddenly disappears. But that doesn't mean that there are, aren't other sources of demand that just are operating on a smaller scale um, than, than the very highly leveraged people. Right. And I, I want to continue on this thread, but you did mention that you have family and I would imagine some colleagues in the open source community in, in Ukraine. Yeah, I'm just curious, are you, are you hearing anything from them today? Um, you know, and, 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 and how's the mood there? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm from Germany. I I, um, I hear mostly what what my family is saying in Germany, and and of course they are very concerned. They don't know what's going to happen, and um, you know, it it does, you know, it feels like we're almost a little bit on a path of repeating some of the mistakes from the last century. And and obviously, I hope that we can pull ourselves back from the brink, but it's certainly not a century that anyone wants to repeat. So, um, right. very scary. I think that we are. Um, living through a time of great uncertainty and and you know i'm as a technologist i'm always thinking about like what can i contribute and and you know maybe this is where we talk a little bit about you know what the role of crypto and blockchain and and these types of technologies can be in a in a more uncertain world like this yeah i i I think that's that's a good thread for us to pursue um and but, but let's rewind a little bit and go back to 2010 and you uh you you discover bitcoin you produce the the famous what is bitcoin video um, I think in 2012 or 13, you start with Ripple. And I, and I remember reading on one of your bios that your dream was to make cryptocurrency mainstream. And like you, you guys have succeeded beyond any, uh, beyond all possible imagination. And yet mainstream crypto is, are things, you know, Dogecoin and the let's go Brandon crypto coin and all the rampant speculation we're talking about. Like, is this what you imagined when you first got into this field? Not at all. And and it, it, in an interesting way, it's sort of fun looking back now and kind of thinking about what I thought would happen, what actually happened. And of course, in hindsight, it all makes perfect sense. But when when I first got interested in crypto um, and you know, the best thing that I can sort of point to is when you read the actual Satoshi's actual white paper um, from that from the, the original Bitcoin white paper, he thinks about it as a payment system, right? Like a, a type of cash to, to replace physical cash, but to be more easily transferable across large distances. Um, and so he obviously was coming from a bit of a, um, you know, libertarian kind of mindset. You can see that in a lot of his postings. Um, but at the same time, the primary purpose was really as a way for people to, to do commerce not so much just as an investment that you just sit and, and hodl, as people say, right? Um, and so really that narrative started, you know, I would say as early as 2011. Uh, that's really when you started to see people saying like, hey, this this could be really valuable. I mean, some people obviously realized that sooner, but um, it really didn't become the dominant narrative until 2011, 2012. And then very quickly took took over all of the the air in the room. And I think that for me, I got into Bitcoin because I was interested in in its role and a potential role in payments. And to this day, that's still the thing I'm more passionate about. And so it for me, it's a little bit sad that so much of the attention has moved away from that. I think there are some people who are still working on that. I will, will give a shout out to the to Lightning Network and anyone who works on that because they are definitely trying to to make Bitcoin easier to transact with day to day. Um, and, and of course, I myself have dedicated a lot of my time over the last five, six years, seven years, even, um, on Interledger, which is a, it's, it's a similar technology, but less um, specific to any one asset. Right, right. I mean, isn't one of the problems, though, that like when um, currencies became, it became easier to transact online, when currencies became, became easier to exchange globally, that, that like it was immediately weaponized by bad actors, right? How, how much of that kind of tortured history of Bitcoin has been an impediment to the original kind of earnest political idealism that fu- fueled uh, the crypto movement? Yeah, I really like that question because it is a tough question that I had to wrestle with a lot, which is, you know, when I first got into crypto, you know, I was in my early 20s and, and I was sort of very um idealistic like you say and and pretty typical for the for the space at the time and um i was very much a libertarian i thought that you know governments should have no role in in how we transact with one another on a voluntary basis and more recently you know i've had to question um that sort of very 
one-sided or extreme position. Um, and basically one of the, um, you know, memories that, that really drove that was I was advising a, a, a nonprofit called Thorn. They, they essentially combat um, uh, child abuse with the use of technology. Um, and I was there just to kind of advise them on blockchain. Um, and they were showing us a presentation just to introduce the topic. And they were showing literally like research that they'd done on dark web websites. And they had this incredible slide where it literally made my blood freeze. Well, not literally, but it made my blood freeze, um, which was a essentially a pricing list of they had kidnapped someone and they were going to do like a live stream and you could bid on different things that were going to happen during that live stream. And, and next uh -huh. to each thing was a, was a Bitcoin address. And, and the Bitcoin address started with a three, which is a uh, page to script hash address, which is a technology or standard that I help work on in the Bitcoin community. And so there's this technology that I helped create that is used for the most horrible purpose. And so ever since then, I've tried to take a little bit more responsibility as a technologist to try to think about how could my technology be used? How could it be abused? Um, and how do I put some balances in, in where I still believe that government power needs to have checks and balances. I still believe that the government shouldn't just be able to spy on us secretly without any warrants and, and uh, oversight by courts and such. But um, I also think that there has to be some enforcement mechanism. You can't just build purely uh, anarchic utilities because then you are essentially right. protecting and, and sheltering uh, people doing very bad stuff. Right. So how do you build that into technology? What, what, what are you doing differently at Coil or with the Interledger, um, you know, that, that maybe brings a little bit more realism to uh, some of the early idealism? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So in the case of, let me maybe contrast um, uh, something that how Lightning Network works versus how Interledger works. So uh, in the Lightning Network, um, the way that they architected it is, that the sender decides the entire path that the packet, the payment packet is going to take. Um, and as a result of that, they're able to use uh, something uh, often called onion routing, where you um, essentially wrap the message that you're trying to send in multiple layers of encryption. And each person that's forwarding your message is only unpacking one layer of encryption. And so they actually don't know where that message is ultimately headed um, or where it's coming from. Um, and in, in Interledger, we've sort of taken the approach of something that works a little bit more like the internet where um, the message is still encrypted and you don't know the data that someone's sending, but you can see the ultimate destination that it's headed towards. And we felt that that was important, A, from a perspective of being more in line with, with current regulation and tr being a little bit more compatible with how, say, the correspondent banking system works and, and something that uh, regulators would find palatable while of course still protecting user privacy. And so if somebody was using Interledger for um, something really bad that was breaking laws in, in, in the country that they're in, um, you could essentially subpoena the um, connectors that are forwarding those packets and you could figure out who they are. And we assume that, um, that the wallet providers are licensed institutions, for example. And so there's certain things that, that just make it a bit more amenable to actually going after bad actors who use the system. Mm -hmm. But it was important to us that we still protect people's privacy and, and um, allowing them to transact with, with as much privacy as possible. Just there should be some backstop to that. Great. Okay. Well, I want to invite everyone who's listening to DM us uh, any questions you want me to ask Stefan, you could DM me directly or DM coil. Uh, Stefan, one of the uh, bewildering things about being a journalist these days is having to keep up with all the buzzwords and the new trends and uh, occasionally uh, pretend that we understand them. So uh, this is my opportunity to get you to explain various things to me. Um, the, the, one of the you know, popular uh, topics in tech right now is of course, Web3, the idea of a new web based on, on the blockchain, uh, which is decentralized and based on, on tokens and serves as this magical check to big platforms. And it's just such a polarizing topic right now. The battle's playing out on, on Twitter in particular. I'm curious what you think about it. Is it. Does the term mean anything to you? Yeah, it's sort of interesting from my perspective because I have one foot in what, I, what, what some would call the web 1.0, 2.0 space where like I grew up with the web. I was a web developer for many years. Um, and I still feel like that's a community that I'm a part of. And then obviously I spent many years in the blockchain community and I feel like I have a 
part of that community. And so I'm, I'm kind of, you know, split right down the middle on this issue. And, and I think that um, where I sort of come down is in trying to apply blockchain technology, there were definitely a lot of cases where I found that it just wasn't a good fit. Um, namely, whenever you're trying to, um, whenever you're trying to replace an entire complex system with an equivalent decentralized one, um, you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Um, it's sort of like, think of it like this. If you had a new technology that helps you automate some industrial process, let's say you can um, automate car manufacturing better, you wouldn't introduce it into the market by making an entirely automatic factory, letting everyone go and just making the factory 100% automated because there's probably going to be some low hanging fruit automation that's easy to do um, and some things that are really hard to automate. So you, you keep most of the people there and you just start to make the processes that where the technology is most applicable, more efficient. And so um, I think with blockchain, the, the way we're going right now is we're building these like very monolithic blockchains that are all or nothing. You either have to move everything onto it and, and fully live in the crypto universe, or it's just not compatible with anything. It doesn't work with anything else, right? And, and what I've always tried to do with, with my work with Interledger, and then also we were working on a smart contracts platform, Codius, um, which I'm still hoping we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get back to one day. Um, we've tried to make technologies that interface with centralized systems, with other types of architectures, and kind of bridge some of that gap. Because I think that's honestly the, the biggest thing that's holding blockchain back from, from escaping the purely speculative realm is better interoperability and better integration with um, both traditional systems, but also future systems that haven't been built yet. Okay, so you're saying so you're saying the the real future isn't Web two or Web three. It's something like Web two point five, where they they meet in the middle. Well, it's it's you know whatever you call it, you know I'm probably not the right person to opine on what the best buzzword is. But if I look at look at what what people currently understand under term Web three, it's sort of a a monolithic architecture based around this blockchain, which is a database, and it also executes code. And the code can only talk, uh, can only address the data that's inside of that blockchain. And if you want to deal with anything else, you need some out external system like an oracle or a bridge or something like that that can that can connect that. And that's just a very clunky architecture. So I think that the blockchain space needs a paradigm shift where they move to a more flexible architecture and then we can see more decentralized services that are easier to adopt, they're easier to integrate with other existing services. And that's when I see something like Web3 taking off more. And I think a lot of the people who are criticizing Web3 are really criticizing the current architecture of Web3, um, as well as some of the, the speculative excesses, of course. Right. I, I thought the, the essay that was going around from a computer security researcher, Moxie Marlin Spike, was pretty compelling. And he was he was arguing that a protocol moves more slowly than a platform. And, and the line that stuck out for me, if something is truly decentralized, it becomes very difficult to change and often remains stuck in time. Um, but perhaps that's what you're talking about, that it's like assessing kind of the, the current state of, of Web3 and not the possible evolution. Yeah, what he's what he's talking about in the article is is exactly the realization that that drove me towards kind of working on intellect, uh, intelligent and so on. Which is when I was working on Bitcoin, I realized very quickly that it was very hard to make changes to the protocol. We had this thing called the hard fork wish list, um, which was all the changes that we thought would improve Bitcoin. And you know, pay to script hash, the one I mentioned earlier that I helped work on, was one of them. But that one um, change took forever it took like eight months or something like that to get it actually deployed and i extrapolated from that to to some of the other changes that we had planned some of which were much more complex and i was like this will take a long time so we'll take 50 years to to get it to where i think it needs to be and so what i realized was um there was a there was a, a huge amount of wisdom in the architecture of the web and the internet where you're only standardizing where different actors are interfacing so like for example if i'm um sending um sending you a, a packet over the internet well i have to address it in some standard way with an ip address and i have to um you know have some some things like a time to live like how many hops can this packet take and so on but it's really not that much that's globally standardized 
And then all the other stuff, the complex stuff, like how does a packet go over a wire or over the airwaves or up to a satellite or, you know, encoded as an optical signal, all that stuff is completely left up to other protocols and things that can, that can adapt locally. And it's not standardized across the whole world. Whereas in most blockchains today or the way blockchains work today, everything is sort of standardized globally, right? Like if, if you change anything about Bitcoin, everyone has to upgrade. And I very quickly realized that that was not going to be viable really, like because any technology you invent, it immediately starts to become obsolete and needs to be upgraded. And, and the sort of right. original vision of like Bitcoin is pure math and it's timeless and so on just did not pan out. It's just not how technology works. And so I think the the way forward is you standardize interoperability protocols, things that are very minimalistic, as simple as you can make them, which is exactly what we tried to do with Interledger. And then you allow people to innovate on top in terms of the applications and the use cases. And you allow people to innovate below in terms of, in, in this case, the ledgers and the, the currencies that people use. And you don't dictate what those should be. Okay, well, put, put on your futurist hat for a minute and tell me what some of those applications and use cases are going to be. Like, how does how does Web3 uh, at maturation look and how does it affect daily life? And I don't know, let's pick a number, 20 years. So this is where I say all the things that are going to sound absolutely hilarious in 30 years when I'm completely wrong. Um, so some, some things that I'm thinking about are um, w when you take the comparison to the internet as a bit of a guide, um, what the internet really enabled was much more granular communication. So you could have um, a lot of uh, smaller messages, more frequent messages, and a lot of that meant that it was not just messages from person to person, but also from computer to computer. And I think there's a bit of an analogy here where we could see a lot more um, payments between computers and a lot more granular payments where you're paying at the exact moment that it's needed um, rather than aggregating a lot of payments together and making it one payment a month or um, one payment where, you know, you, you know, for example, in content, which is maybe a, a, an example where people can rub their heads around, rather than paying Netflix and then Netflix pays all the different creators that contribute to the Netflix platform, it might be more viable to pay all the creators directly and, and be a little bit more, create more direct connections of commerce. That would be one example. Well, um, that's a lot of that's a lot of destruction and disruption for them for inter intermediaries. Yeah, I mean, again, I think to the extent that Netflix is adding a lot of value, um, you know, like they're making really nice clients that, that work on my TV and on my iPad and everywhere else. Like, I do think that there will be a, a role for platforms. I just think that um, there's an opportunity to create different models, different alternatives, um, and ways to to. Um, make, increase the efficiency in the system. Like, for example, there's a lot of streaming services that are smaller that don't have apps on every platform that I want to use them on. And it would be really nice if somebody made like a protocol that, you know, someone can make a general streaming client that has all the features that I want and I can still watch all the content from all the different streaming platforms that I like on it, for example. Um, and I think some of that could be enabled if you have a standardized way to transfer value where I'm paying for different things um, regardless of, of who made the app and if that's the same person who, who's running the platform. So we're about a year into the NFT craze. I think, I think it, was, it was about this time last year when Jack Dorsey uh, sold his first tweet for $3 million. Um, and it seemed like a, a joke then, and it seems very much real now. Um, what, do you, what do you think, Stefan? Is it a fad? Um, have, have you bought or sold any NFTs? I have actually not. Uh, this is one thing that often surprises people when, when they talk to me. And, and, you know, obviously I'm very associated with the crypto space, but I'm not much of a crypto trader and I'm not actually, you know, even trying out a lot of stuff uh, because I, I have certain things that I believe in and, and certain things that I'm interested in. Um, I've not traded in the NFTs. My opinion on it is that if you want to do um, ownership of digital goods and you're comfortable with the fact that it's obviously a little bit arbitrary, right? Like, you know, I can say I, I own this NFT and it can be registered somewhere to me. Um, but at the end of the day, it is still a file that someone else can copy, as people have pointed out, like Moxie, for example. Um, but if you're comfortable with that idea, like storing the ownership of that on a blockchain is actually not a terrible idea because 
um, you know, if you store it on some server somewhere and that person who runs that server eventually turns it off, that's not a great um, outcome for the holders of that asset. And so, yeah, if you're looking for a use case for blockchain, it's not it's not a bad use of the te technology, which is something I don't say very often. I think a lot of proposed use cases for blockchains actually don't pan out, but this one does make sense from a purely technical perspective. Okay, so on the on the spectrum of like utter utter faith that NFTs are the future on one side, and then the and then the ridicule on the other, it sounds like you're you're kind of shading more towards the the faith side that you believe it may, maybe not. Maybe not uh, the uh, all, all the kind of dramatic opportunity that proponents uh, project for it, but that you you think there are good applications. Yeah, well, I think the important distinction here is that I think that if you think there is a use case for NFTs, I think using blockchain as the power, the technology that powers them, makes sense, especially if you're using, you know, shameless plug like some of the more efficient blockchains like XRP Ledger. Um, the where I'm less certain and what's kind of outside of my area of expertise is how strong is that use case? Is that something that people will be interested in long term? Will people always, um, you know, be collecting digital items that, that have other people have created and that are sort of collectibles? Um, some of my friends who I, I recognize as more authorities on that um, question seem to think so. Um, mm -hmm. For me personally, I just don't know. Like, it seems yeah. definitely a lot of hype right now, which definitely won't last. And then the question is, like, when the hype is over, what what will stick? What what will people do long term? I mean, it certainly seems like there is some absurdity. Uh, for example, the the board apes fad feels like I don't know, kind of trading cards from the '80s or something. But they're selling; people are buying and selling them for real money. So it's interesting. It's um, a bit of a price of admission for this community and a status symbol, right? It's sort of like if you have one of these certain rare NFTs, it might give you access to a certain Discord server or a certain event or to certain people. Um, and for, for if, you know, if you're a crypto entrepreneur or something like that and, and you care about those connections, um, that might be worth that much to you. Again, I, I can't you know, say if, it's not worth it to me, um, but I'm also in, in the very nice situation that I, I have a reputation and I'm, I'm a well-known person in the space and so maybe I don't need that help, but for somebody... Right. Um, who feels that they need it if if they think so that that's that's more power to them right okay um next topic uh the the metaverse we're, we're seeing uh, major technology companies rebrand themselves and uh and, and many of its competitors all moving towards this vision which we've been talking about in the industry for a long time of, of virtual reality and not just for games right to uh, to live our digital lives. Um, I, I remember, Stefan, you being at one point a prolific gamer. How much uh, interest and faith do you have in the metaverse? Yeah, metaverse falls into that category of buzzwords where I'm not really completely understanding what's new about it, but everyone seems to be excited about it. Another example like that would be cloud. I, someone told me this anecdote, which I, I, you know, I don't have any source for that, so take it with a grain of salt, but um, apparently it was like two... Um, salespeople at a large enterprise tech company um, talking to each other and one person was like, I don't really understand what cloud is all about. It seems like we're still just selling servers like we always have. And the other person says, um, well, we're still selling the same servers, but now they sell a lot better. Um, and so I think for me, Metaverse is a little bit in that category where like, we've seen massively uh, MMORPGs, like massive multiplayer games. Like I remember I grew up with uh, World of Warcraft was a big one, and I, I actually recently revisited that, which was a lot of fun. And so for me, like adding more immersion with VR and adding more integration with social networks are all cool inter incremental changes. I don't think it's such a game changer. Like I remember playing around with Second Life many years ago, which had a lot of hype where you could have like, like I think IBM did like an entire uh, virtual campus in Second Life. And, and you, you can still see the ruins of that, which it's actually kind hmm. of fun and eerie it's to still, walk around, around. things and abandoned, you know, areas where people clearly were very excited once upon a time, you, you know, on the walls, you would still see the bulletin board where it is like a, a meeting and you know and, and the, of course the date was like long in the past so um i, I don't know i, I have to tell you a crazy crazy story i was i i got it i was interested and i vaguely remember nintendo had a virtual reality gaming set called virtual boy and i went to research it and i went to the wikipedia page and i was scrolling down 
and there was a photo it said like man playing nintendo's virtual boy in a in a in a like japanese arcade and the photo was of me it was like grabbed from twitter uh from uh, Flickr, circa like 2003 just bizarre mm -hmm. but but like an you know indication of how long these ideas have been uh have been in vogue and now and now here they are back again Totally. And, and sometimes, you know, a buzzword can be a catalyst, right? Like sometimes you don't really reach mass adoption and then suddenly a, no real technical innovation happens, but a big wave of investment and interest comes along and everyone wants to check it out and be part of it. Um, and I think it is actually interesting to think about, you know, how things like NFTs and, and the metaverse um, correlate or interact, where like it's always been a, you know, popular way to monetize these kinds of platforms to sell things like items and, and so on but it's always been um obviously done centrally where you have like the operator of the platform ultimately being the one who tracks uh, the ownership of any of these virtual assets and to my earlier point like it is actually quite interesting to track ownership where um, even if that original operator goes away i can still trade and still use those those assets and so it makes it makes it just a lot more attractive to own one of these assets if I don't have to trust, you know, XYZ gaming company to keep the servers running you know, many years into the future. Right. Although that is certainly not the direction that the industry appears to be going in. It feels like we're, we're going to get many metaverses, each, each of them wholly owned and controlled by your like friendly local social network. Well, that's, I, I think, because of the economics and it'd be very interesting to see how the industry tackles that. But like one of the things I was thinking about is like, you know, how does Twitter, since we're on Twitter spaces right now, how did they decide what blockchains and, and what um, technologies to support in terms of, you know, they, they have um, NFT based uh, avatars now. Right. And so how do they decide which platforms to support? And, you know, at some point, you know, will, social media platforms, which is ultimately where you'll want to use your NFTs, like games and, and social media platforms, the ones that are the most popular will have the most um, influence in terms of um, which which technologies will they choose. And it's, it's possible that there will be sort of a standard that emerges eventually where like, okay, that's the one everyone supports. Or it's possible that it actually becomes a point of monetization where like you have different platforms paying um, to be included and paying to, to for that access. So very interesting to see how that develops. Um, to your point, it could we could also see like total silofication where like you know every major social media platform and every major game has their own standard for NFTs that they're trying to push. Um, but that seems like not a stable state. So probably right. some some winner will emerge from that. And you could imagine different countries also exerting their influence and authority over the local metaverses. Um, obviously, authoritarian states are, aren't going to want the, the, the free-for-all. Yeah, and, and to my, like, again, I keep coming back to this point of interoperability because that's ultimately the approach that I'm most interested in because I think it is the most powerful and, and the best outcome for for society. And so the question is, how do we bring about that outcome, which is, you know, I have total choice, right? Like, I, I can use any blockchain to mint and store my NFT and I can use it everywhere. Like that's the thing that we all want. And, and it's interesting as a technologist to think about how do you get there? Now, um, I've probably thought about it more in the context of payments and, and sort of Interledger is my answer and how do we get there? Um, but you could do the exact same exercise for NFTs and think about what it would an NFT interoperability protocol look like. So maybe that's something that um, will be a future future project for myself or someone else who's who's in, thinking a similar vein well i'm getting a lot of good questions via dm some of which i i uh, actually understand some of which i i don't um and i want to get to those in a second but let's just talk a little bit more about monetization on the web i know you spend a lot of time thinking about it at a time when there's really an existential crisis um you know for creators for 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 uh for developers and even big companies like Facebook and, and you know, as, as uh, Apple uh, and, and Android changes the rules of, of targeted advertising. So, you know, what, what do you think the future of monetization on the web looks like, particularly for, for creators who are just kind of trying to find their way amid all these giant tech companies? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a huge topic. The, the, so let me try to unpack that a little bit. I think that part of the 
interest in web3 is a bit of is of a bit of a backlash to that current model where it's turned out that the most competitive are really highly scalable very centralized platforms like the social media companies and, and ad networks that, that dominate tech today and it's sort of interesting to think about why they've been so what what, what the huge advantages were that put them into that position because as we all know the web didn't necessarily start out that way it started out with you know pretty flat and and a lot of different websites and you know I, I remember a lot of people were running their own website myself included running many websites at the time and so um, how did it become so uh, consolidated and I think the business model is definitely one of the biggest reasons right like you're looking at um, the fact that if I just have traffic that alone doesn't make me any money. I have to also have some way to monetize that traffic and that attention that, I, that my site is getting. And the two dominant models that have emerged, one is um, monthly subscriptions um, and the other one is advertising. Both of those models have huge economies of scale. In the case of advertising, if I have a huge number of visitors or if I'm an ad network, like I can have more data over about each user and so obviously advertising to a user that is um, profiled and where I know a lot about them I can target the ads better I make a lot more money and so obviously larger ad networks are always going to outcompete smaller ones all other things equal and then with subscription services well you know people have limited budgets and they have limited attention spans and and so you're going to sign up for the must-have subscription services which are going to be the ones with the most content that's relevant to you and so you're going to end up with a consolidation there. So both of those business models have sort of built-in consolidation force built in. And the um, counterpoint to that, that that we think is like, well, why are we even using those two models? Can't we just do it the way we do it in, in basically every other business where if I go to a grocery store, like they're not going to show me ads as a way to pay for my groceries. Like they're just going to, I'm just going to pay. And so if you had an efficient enough payment mechanism that is efficient not just in terms of how the money is transferred, but also how the, the payment authorization happens. Like if I had to enter my credit card number on every website I go to, I probably wouldn't use a service like that. And so it has to be in, in all facets extremely efficient. And that's essentially what we what we built with, with Coil, where we have a, a monthly subscription and every website you go to, it sends a little bit of money to that website. Now, obviously that needs its own kind of scale, which is like it needs, um, the standard needs to have scale, there needs to be enough websites that adopt that. Um, but at least it's some, as far as the technology is concerned, like it seems to work. So um, it's kind of interesting to think about when there is an alternative business model, how do those dynamics change? And um, to me, that's actually more important than the, what people seem most focused on um, in the Web3 discussion, which is more the technical architecture rather than the business models. Right. But it is it, it poses the kind of mother of all two sided marketplace problems. Right. Like, how do you get the critical mass of creators and how do you get the critical mass of publishers to go and embrace another standard? I guess if the economics are better, they'll they'll move. But, you know, the the you know, the current the current uh, players have have a lot of advantages and can kind of outcompete on price. And, and they've got the advantage of data. Yeah. But that's the beauty of an open standard is like, um it creates an opportunity for anyone who can answer that question to make a lot of money for themselves, right? Um, just like, you know, when the web first came about, the, the question was like, well, if there's all these different web servers and, and sure there's links between them, but really how do you find anything when there's these trillions of web pages? And, and Google had the answer for that. And so they made a lot of money. So just because there's no built-in token doesn't mean you can't make uh, money in that system. And so, um, what I'm what I'm expecting or what I'm hoping for is that as we continue to develop the technology and we continue to open it up to more and more people, there will be more and more innovation coming from other folks who have answers to some of these questions. And I, I've sort of had to realize in a very humbling way that I don't have all the answers. And so, um, you know, I've kind of shifted focus to, you know, increasing access into, in, into Ledger and, and getting more wallets with more functionality that allows other people to build whatever their vision for Interledger is. Um, so that's that's kind of where, where we are now. I mean, I think this is precisely where a couple of listeners are asking uh, pointed questions. So uh, uh, at Dennis NYC underscore EDU asks, how will the end user experience, 
how will end users experience COIL in three to five years? What's on the development roadmap? And then Elliot Lee at Intelliot asks, um, he, um, he's asking, yeah, what are you most excited about for COIL in the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, so the project that we're fully focused on right now is an open source project. It's actually not a COIL commercial product. It's a complete open source project, and it's called Rafiki. And, um, you know, without going into too much, like, um, technical jargon, it's essentially an open source um, implementation of everything that um, a wallet would have to implement a, a financial institution wanted to offer an Interledger wallet would have to implement to offer all the things that Interledger has to offer. Um, and where this kind of came from was we realized that like the current wallets in the Interledger ecosystem actually only offer very limited functionality. Really, you can only receive payments. And so, um, you know, that's okay for Coil in our use case or current use case with this $5 subscription because we send the money out. Other people can receive it into their Interledger wallet. But it's very limiting if you want to do anything else. And so um, we we diagnosed that the reason for that was that um, wallet companies just didn't have the bandwidth to build a, a whole Interledger stack where you can send money and um, you can do subscriptions and you can authorize third-party applications to access your wallet and all this kind of stuff. And so we embarked on this journey to build an open source implementation of all of that so that wallets can deploy that open source stack um, very easily and not have to do all that work themselves. So that's what we're focused on right now. Um, and then as that rolls out, I think we will, you know, reassess and try to figure out like what new products can we build around that? Um, you know, what other problems are emerging in the market that we could help solve? Um, but right now we're just pretty focused on this um, open source project because we think that's the next thing that's needed from, from Interledger. Okay, so that's Rafiki, and that helps me understand half of this question from Mickey B. Fresh, or at Mr. Fresh Time, a, a great the Twitter handle. Uh, so I'm just going to read this, uh, Stefan, and maybe you can uh, translate it. Uh, Mickey B. Fresh writes, I'd like to hear about the plans for Tiger Beetle and Rafiki and how they will come together. What else are you building for uh, Tiger Beetle DB for? Yeah, uh, great question, and one that actually has a fairly direct and simple answer, which is, um, so just for those who don't know, so I explained what Rafiki is, um, and so I'll quickly explain what Tiger Beetle is. So Tiger Beetle is a very high-performance uh, distributed um, uh, accounting database. So if you're, you know, any kind of um, institution that's recording transactions, so whether that's a bank or a wallet provider or anything like that, you can use Tiger Beetle to record lots and lots of transactions very quickly. Um, and so the, um, the way that those two come together is, well, Rafiki is a, an open source stack that's, um, among other things, needs to record transactions. And so we're actually uh, planning to use and using uh, Tiger Beetle as the back end for Rafiki. And so what that'll do is it'll mean that if you deploy Rafiki as a wallet provider, you can get with very modest hardware uh, requirements, uh, very, very high throughput, um, very large number of packets that you're processing. And so that's gonna further decrease the cost for wallet providers to adopt Interledger and create a better ratio between the functionality that it can offer to their customers and the functionality that Interledger offers in general versus the cost that they have to pay in, in terms of server and integration costs. So we're really trying to make that ratio as favorable as possible. Okay. Okay. Well, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, so let me ask the question that uh, I patiently waited uh, 45 minutes to ask Stefan, which is, um, as, as some people probably know, you, you became sort of quite famous recently uh, for, what's the right word? Not, not uh, losing uh, uh, 7,000 Bitcoin, but, but uh, I guess forgetting the password, right? And it's come to really dominate. I have to say, it's come to dominate your, your Google mentions. I don't know how uh, comfortable you are, you are with that. But um, yeah, I mean, because that was such a high profile story, give us an update. I, 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 in fact, when, when this Twitter Spaces was announced, some people reached out to me asking, say, uh, professing that they could help you and wanted an introduction. So I'm sure you've gotten a lot of these requests. What, what's the current uh, status on the, the missing password? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I, I don't really mind the, the attention around that. I, I think that um, 
for me, it's it's uh, highlighting um, a, a big issue, which is key management is hard. Um, and so hopefully a lot of people that have read that story have taken a, away from it that they need to think about how they're storing their passwords and how they're storing their own keys and how to make sure that they don't lose access. Um, and hopefully it's it's saved, you know, one or two people's life savings um, in the process. Um, in terms of updates all around that, I, um, I've i been moving to a different country. Um, I'm still in the process of kind of getting set up in, in my new home and everything. So um, that's kind of taken, you know, center stage. Um, and of course, I'm also still fully focused on coil and, and trying to drive coil forward and IntelliJ forward. Um, so it's been, you know, as crazy as that might sound to a lot of people, it's been tough to really find a time to worry about the wallet too much. For me, the wallet is, it's a huge amount of money. Uh, there's a lot that I could do with it, both for myself personally, but also in the world. Um, and so I am planning to recover it, but I also have always had a very long-term perspective when it came to um, crypto. I don't think you know crypto is going anywhere anytime soon. Maybe the price will be lower um, for a while, but it might come back. So I'm not in a rush to recover it. And I also only get one shot. So um, when I right. do take that shot, I want to be, I want to have everything fully teed up. In terms of people reaching out, I'm obviously super grateful for all the people who've reached out. Um, there are some things where I'm like, okay, I've heard this enough times now, so please don't reach out. It's just <laughs> hypnosis. I've heard this enough times. Um, the um, the people that have been the most helpful are the people who have um, kind of a technical, who are working in that area of like forensic data recovery. Um, in particular, people who are um, doing that on a, a on a professional level, and and so I've had some really really helpful contacts that have come out out of this um, public attention. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm also talking to some folks who are um, looking to um, help other people who to recover their wallets. And so that's something I'm still thinking about is like, how can I use some of this attention to help other people who've lost coins and, and kind of help them? So more to come on, on that. Stefan, at least you're not the guy from the UK who's trying to excavate the local landfill where he ditched his, uh, his uh, hard drive. Yeah, that's a tough one. I I, I wish him the best. I, I, yeah, it's, I, I don't have, to have my wallet, you know, I, I just have to break into it. Right. Um, okay, well, um, I think we're running out of time. I, 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 queued, I queued, up, queued up one last question for you, uh, which is is this. Do you, do you have as much um, equal or less conviction about Bitcoin and crypto uh, as the future of finance as you once did? Where, where are you... Where's your overall sentiment uh, right now? So that's a really interesting one. Um, and it definitely does shift over time as, you know, I learn more about the space and, and different things happen. Um, so when I first got into Bitcoin, it seemed like the solution, I think. And then I realized that because of this fact factor that I mentioned, which is it can't evolve quickly enough, I started to move away from the idea that like Bitcoin is the answer and I started to look for a new answer. Um, and I think as far as the, the, the use case that I'm interested in, which is moving money around the world, um, I think that IntelliJ, you know, obviously a somewhat self-serving answer, but um, I, I believe that is a better solution. That's why I'm spending all my time on it. Um, I think that the other use case, which is, you know, having a, a store of value, um, as well as in the case of other cryptos like XRP, for example, they're focused on being sort of a transactional asset, like a way to provide liquidity around the world. Um, I still th think those use cases are very much alive and, and I still have a lot of optimism around those use cases. So um, it's it turned out to be useful, just not for the thing that I thought it was useful for, um, which is you know purely payments. Interesting. Uh, Stefan, a.k.a. Just Moon, uh, this has been great. It's, uh, it's great talking to you uh, again. Hope I get to see you again soon. And uh, thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me, and I hope people got something out of it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.